Many have wondered why K.J. Wright didn't return to the Seahawks last season. We'll be sharing some insight from the player himself on our latest offering of Locked on Seahawks. <laughs> You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12, this is your host Corbin Smith, you're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast and it's a bit of a crossover episode today. Joining me is my co-host Ty Gonzalez of Locked On Mariners. If you follow the Seahawk Maven, he also writes for that website along with Nick Lee. So happy to have Ty on board. We are going to be diving into your questions, our weekly mailbag segment, and of course, what went down with K.J. Wright and the Seahawks? Why he didn't come back in 2021 and ultimately played for the Las Vegas Raiders? Some really interesting details coming from the player himself. Thanks for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Now for your lead story here on Locked on Seahawks. Last offseason, K.J. Wright hit free agency. He was coming off one of the best seasons of his career. The only player in the NFL with double-digit tackles and passes defensed. Many expected that he was ultimately going to end up back in Seattle, but if he didn't, he would get swept up by another team fairly quickly, and then he waited, and he waited, and he waited. We get to the start of training camp, and he is still unsigned. I think many of us, Ty, who follow the Seahawks closely at that point were like, it's only a matter of time till he inevitably is going to return to the Seahawks, and yet... That never happened. Ended up signing a deal with the Raiders, played the entire year, mostly as a reserve, a rotational player for the Raiders. Had a solid season for them as they got back to the playoffs. Didn't come back to the Seahawks, and it's left a lot of questions that now we have some pretty good answers on based on some insight from the player himself. Yeah, so K.J. Wright hopped on with the Bussin' with the Boys podcast with current free agent linebacker Will Compton. Uh, it a show that's also hosted by Titans left tackle Taylor Luan, but it was only Compton on this episode. And I understood that this show uh, particularly allows players to open up about things. And, and sure enough, KJ was very open about his past offseason experience. He talked about the anxiety and the stress that stemmed from it and how, you know, coming off of the year that he just did, you know, switching over to Sam Linebacker, playing extremely well in 2020, and finishing in the NFL Top 100 players. So he was voted by his peers and into that list for the first time in his career. He landed at number 67 on that list. He was the only impending free agent on that list as well, which he mentioned in his interview. And he thought he was going to be a, you know, first day free agent signing or shortly thereafter, after the free agents uh, period started on March 17th and no one called. And he emphasized this throughout the interview on the podcast that it wasn't a matter of him getting little nibbles from teams here and there. It was straight up. His phone was completely silent for months on end, And he eventually was contacted by the 49ers. They ended up offering him a visit. He didn't make that visit at the end of the day. They still offered him a contract, but it was for the veteran minimum. And I think, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're watching this podcast, if you've been following the Seahawks for any sort of given time, you know that that's probably a slap in the face to the kind of player that K.J. Wright is. Yeah. And he said that. He said, you know, I, I'm never going to sign the name K.J. Wright next to a veteran minimum salary. That's just not going to happen. And so shortly thereafter, Gus Bradley hit him up. And, of course, there's obviously the relationship there from uh, when Bradley was the defensive coordinator in 2011 and 2012 for, for his rookie and second years in Seattle. And uh, the Raiders let him pay a visit. They offered him a contract. But he still extended a opportunity to the Seahawks to keep him in Seattle. He went to Pete Carroll. He said straight up, you know, I want to I want to stay in Seattle. I don't want to leave. What can we do to make this happen? At this point, it's August, it's September. He's getting anxious. He wants to join a team before the start of the regular season. He wants to join a team before week two, so his contract can be guaranteed for the whole year. And 
he talks to Pete Carroll, who basically says, you know, I, I hate this, but let's see see what we can do. And I'll talk to John Schneider. And as far as I can tell, obviously we're only getting his side of the story here. Uh, but it seems like he was basically ignored and he ended up signing the contract with the Raiders that he did, which was for $3.2 million one year. And that's that. It's crazy if, yeah, and again, KJ Wright has always seemed like a guy that's pretty upfront, pretty honest about things. So yeah. I would take what he says. I would take the man for his word here. And it seems mm-hmm. like it really checks off with how things went down last offseason. I mean, months that he was unsigned and nobody really there were some reports that surfaced but apparently those reports didn't really mean anything because we know the Cowboys never talked to him according to Wright himself the 49ers were the first team that really reached out and then it's a veteran minimum deal the Seahawks through all this he was communicating with Pete Carroll and Pete Carroll hinted at that several times in press conferences oh I'm maintaining communication with KJ Wright but he never would come out and say we're talking about trying to bring him back. Pete Carroll never said anything like that. So it really shouldn't have surprised anyone, especially with them going to more bare fronts where they were wanting more pass rusher oriented overhang defenders when they had five defensive linemen up in the box. They didn't view KJ Wright as that guy, even though he checked off all the other boxes, a great run defender can set the edge comfortable in coverage. It, It masked some of his athletic deficiencies as he's getting older. It seemed like it was a solid positional fit and they decided to go a different direction. I just, if this is the way that it really played out, and again, I'm not doubting the story that K.J. Wright is giving us because that's probably what happened. Uh, But I'd be really curious to hear a 100% sincere response from Pete Carroll and John Schneider on how how all this went down. Because this is a guy that for a decade was one of the best outside linebackers in the NFL. He's probably a ring of honor player for the Seahawks. He's been that great in his career. And he had one of his best seasons in 2020. And yet they didn't bring him back. I know they wanted to play Daryl Taylor. It just felt like there was somewhere that they could have played him. And he was pleading to join them in a reserve role, in a diminished role. And they still didn't make it happen. And Benson Mayo was playing most of the snaps at the same spot. And he was making just a little over a million dollars less than what KJ Wright would have made if they would have given him a similar contract. So It's just, it's one of those things that stinks because we know that this is a business and this is how things operate in the NFL, but it stinks they had to play out this way for a player of this caliber that has been an icon that fans have loved. It's done so much in the community off the field as well that it ended up playing out this way when this is a defense that probably could have used him this past season. Yeah, especially in a rotational role. You know, I think you could work in uh, his abilities just for matchup purposes, you know, because, yeah, he doesn't have the pass rushing ability, but he can still set the edge really well. He plays the screens really well. And, I mean, they even refer to him as the screen master. Jordan Brooks said that. Bobby Wagner said that this past year. And, I mean, that was kind of a huge problem for them as well, was defending screen plays. They got burned by those uh, a, a ton, and that was kind of a consistent issue for them for most of the year. They kind of figured it out towards the end of the year, but... Yeah, I mean, there were certain situations where you feel like, yeah, they could swap him out for, for you know, or, or you could swap swap out Benson Mayoa for him and uh, play the matchups there and, and, you know, work him in. But, yeah, this is uh, – just to, to go back to what you were saying, this is just – it's an incredibly unfortunate scenario here that has played out, that has apparently played out at least. And, um, you know, with a organizational legend who – you know, he said that he he feels that he built a Ring of Honor career. I agree with him wholeheartedly. I think he's, uh, like I said, an organizational legend. You know, who was unfortunately overshadowed a lot by the greatness of Bobby Wagner. But I mean, those two combined—that's one of the best linebacking tandems of the last thirty years in the NFL. Like they are—they were an incredible duo, and um, you know, won a lot of games together. Racked up a ton of tackles, racked up, you know, all that stuff. A uh, ton of accolades there. You know, and unfortunately, you know, Wright only got the one Pro Bowl nod uh, in 2016, but he absolutely deserved more. And yeah, it's just really, it's really sad because um, you look back on it in retrospect, and obviously, you know, hindsight is 2020. 20, and and I, I don't blame the Seahawks for wanting to get Jordan Brooks more playing time. Like, that's yeah. totally fine. I get that. They invested the first round pick in, pick in him, and he's 
incredibly talented and we're seeing him develop into a really, really good player. Uh, but yeah, th- there's no denying that KJ Wright at some point could have been useful for this defense. He wouldn't have saved the defense. They still would have struggled mightily. But you look at some of the issues that they struggle with, he kind of, it, it all signs really point to that void that he left with his departure. Yeah, and I don't think that you can underscore the leadership aspect that was lost yeah. with him not being out there either, away from his on-field football skills. And I think it's fitting that Clint Hurt was talking in his introductory press conference about, and he just kept circling the wagons back to this, that they have to do a better job using their personnel. I think you can look at last year with how this situation unfolded. I can understand the decisions that they made, but then Benson Mayoa and Daryl Taylor, who were at their best rushing the passer, the amount of times that they were dropping back in coverage where K.J. Wright would have been much better in that role. If those two guys were rushing the passer more, then absolutely this move makes sense. But the way they used their personnel, it didn't add up. If they were going to use those players the way that they ended up using them, K.J. Wright would have been the better fit. And you could have just used Daryl Taylor rushing off the edge at Leo spot where he is at his best. And Benson Mayowa, you could use those guys in rotational roles. And maybe your pass rush ultimately is better because of that. And so yeah. those are questions we can look upon and wonder, but we're never going to know the real answers for because it's past. It's been done. And now KJ Wright's going to be looking for his next team. Who knows where he's going to be playing next year. But it's unfortunate that things unfolded this way with him leaving Seattle and not being brought back for the 2021 season. We're going to get to your guys' mailbag questions here in a moment. Free agency draft, tons of questions about players set to hit the market as well. We're looking forward to tackling as many as we can. Football might be over for the season. The basketball is in full steam for both college and pro hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. Bet Online remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC odds, maybe baseball at some point, Olympic coverage, and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Thursday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me for a crossover episode, Locked On Mariners host, Ty Gonzalez. Let's get to our mailbag questions here. First one coming from Kid Andy 24 tweets. Do you expect the Seahawks to fix their entire O line like the Chiefs did last offseason? For example, trading for Orlando Brown Jr. What say you, Ty? The offensive line does have several openings already with several guys heading to free agency. Yeah, I think you got to start at left tackle, uh, first of all. And, and the big one is is Dwayne Brown hitting unrestricted free agency. Doesn't seem like he's going to be retiring anytime soon, or at least for this year. So for me, I, I, I would be very surprised at that point if he is going to play next year, if he's not playing in a Seahawks uniform. And I think if he is not playing in a Seahawks uniform, you got an even bigger issue on your hands there with Russell Wilson, because that's his guy. So I would think that the organization is going to do everything it can to bring back Dwayne Brown. And he was uh, he was still playing at a pretty high level there uh, in the second half of the season. Obviously, he had a rough first half of the year, but I think he only allowed nine pressures per pro football focus over his last eight games or something. So, you know, it, we've, we've seen him still be able to play at a considerably high level. So um, I, I think that's kind of where you you start. And then at center... I would. I'm not opposed to bringing Ethan Posick back. I thought he played pretty strong football towards the second half of the season, and uh, but I'm. I also wouldn't let that deter me from going and investing he- heavily at the position, which they haven't really done over the last few years. I, I really like Bradley Bozeman, the uh, free agent center that's uh, coming out of Baltimore. Uh, Brian Allen out of uh, Los Angeles is also a free agent. Ryan Jensen's also a free agent. I think we have a question about him. Um, so yeah, there's there's um. There's quite a few guys at the center position that I would like for them to uh, to explore, and uh, but I think bringing back Postic would be a solid solid move just to uh, just add some depth there. And then at right tackle, I, you know, I really like what Jake Curran did towards the end of the year, and I think the Seahawks really like what he did. They obviously, in, in, you know, pretty much built their whole day three draft strategy around drafting Stone Forsythe, or at least that's what they said. So obviously, I, I think they're going to give him ample opportunity to. Uh, 
crack the starting lineup and you know but i also wouldn't be opposed to them trying to go after someone like morgan moses who's a free agent after his lone year with the jets and and kind of fits what their what their system is so uh i don't i don't think that they're going to completely overhaul the offensive line i don't think you're going to see something similar to the chiefs i think it's mostly going to be bringing guys back that you know because i mean you looked at you look at what rashad penny was able to do last year towards the end of the season that a lot of that falls on the offensive line i think they want to keep that continuity going obviously got a new offensive line coach and andy dickerson who was the run game coordinator last year we'll see how maybe his influence impacts things but yeah overall i i think things will stay fairly status quo maybe except for at center which i, I think that would be a good spot to maybe invest some dollars in Second question coming from Marcus here tweets, if Seattle can't sign a star pass rusher, do you see any possibilities that could be available to acquire via trade? So this is a great question, Marcus, and we know that the Seahawks have been willing to do this in the past. They traded a third rounder to the Texans to get Jadevian Clowney a couple of years ago. That ultimately was just a one-year rental, but they have made trades in the past to bring in proven pass rushers. It's going to be tougher to do when you don't have a first-round pick, which they don't have because they traded it for Jamal Adams. They have a first-rounder in 2023. They've got a second and third-rounder this year. They get second and third-rounders next year. They get a full tray of draft picks for next year. If you really wanted to go down that rabbit hole and start considering trading some of your future draft picks Rams style, there might be a few players that you could justify. I don't know that the Bears will try to move Khalil Mack, but he missed a bunch of games last year. His production has been quite as good. I think he's still a very good player. Who knows what the Bears would want in return, but that might be a name to throw out there. I've mentioned Daniil Hunter on the podcast several times over the last week. His contract, his cap hit is over $20 million, so I can't see anybody wanting to trade for that contract unless there was going to be an extension included in that deal to lower that cap hit. Hunter is still under 30 years old. He's had injuries the last two years, but he had six sacks in seven games last year. He is still a very good pass rusher when he is healthy. He's been one of the elite players in the game rushing off the edge. I think he'd be a great scheme fit for the Seahawks. So those would be two names of veteran pass rushers that I could see potentially being available to trade for. I still think free agency, though, is where you want to go because there's a chance you could have guys like Chandler Jones, Von Miller, Hassan Reddick from the Panthers, former Cardinals defensive end, uh, Manuel Agba, there are a number of really solid pass rushers that are going to potentially be hitting the market, which gives the Seahawks a chance to be aggressive and get one of those players without giving up any more draft capital. I just don't think they are quite in the position where you can be flinging around first and second round picks more to try to bring in players. Now, if you get a really good deal for a guy like Daniil Hunter or Khalil Mack where you don't have to give up a first, then certainly that is something you got to explore because those are elite pass rushers and there are only so many of them in the league. But I would be surprised if John Schneider does that this time around just because they're coming off a 7-10 season and you do have a good free agent class. You have a draft class that's got quite a few solid pass rushers that could be available on day two. So the Seahawks should have a chance to be able to add to this group without giving up draft picks. You want to get an alpha rusher, though. So it's going to be important to be very aggressive in free agency. And if the right trade opportunity is there, then of course, John Schneider is always going to have his phone out ready to listen and negotiate. Next question here from DeFran tweets, if you were Pete and John, what would be your draft strategy? What positions would you target with our current picks? I'm going to leave the floor to you on this tie. Yeah. Two or three positions at pick 41 and in the third round, those first two picks, which couple positions do you see being the biggest focal points based on this draft class and the Seahawks needs? Yeah, I think you got to start with edge. Uh, the edge position group in this class is incredibly deep. There's going to be a lot of options there at pick number 41. There's going to be a lot of options at pick number 72. Honestly, throughout the entire event, there's going to be options at the edge position. There, there's a lot of intriguing guys there. Interior defensive line, particularly guys that can rush from the interior. That's another big one. Uh, there, there's a quite considerable depth there, and uh, that that also fits exactly what the Seahawks need. They need to get a little bit better at, at pressuring the quarterback from the interior. And uh, I actually really like the tight end class this year. Uh, there's quite a few guys that I really like. Um, Jake Ferguson out of Wisconsin, Kate Otten out of Washington, Isaiah Likely out of Coastal Carolina. Those are a couple of guys that that might be there at 42 or, or at 41 or 72. 
Um, yeah, I especially, you know, if they're not going to bring back Gerald Everett or Will Disley, uh, either one of those guys or both of those guys, if neither one comes back, uh, I think that's a good way to, to maybe add some tight end depth on the cheap. Uh, there's quite a few interesting guys there. So I think this draft in general, just generally speaking about this class in particular, I, I think it lines up well with what the Seahawks need. I think this is kind of the ideal situation. It's unfortunate that they don't that they don't have a first round pick to take advantage of here, but with a more normal slew of draft picks compared to what they had last year, I, I think this is a this is a good opportunity for them to build up this roster. Always Alvi tweets prediction on who has the toughest off season in the division. So I'm just going to say this. If you would have asked me this question three weeks ago, I'd probably say the Seahawks because you've still got this Russell Wilson cloud. However legitimate these trade rumors are at this point, you've still got that cloud hovering over the organization to an extent. Maybe it's all media driven at this point. Certainly his agent didn't help the cause last year. And we know there's been some wording that's kept things open for Russell Wilson as well. But you have that hovering over the organization. You just had your worst season in over a decade, the worst year you've had with Pete Carroll as the coach. You've got an aging middle linebacker with a 20 plus million dollar cap hit. So there are a number of reasons why the Seahawks could have been the easy candidate there coming off a really disappointing season. And now everybody's on the hot seat. You got to get things turned around. It's a critical off season, but I'm going to go down to the desert now for the answer to this one, because the Cardinals have their own quarterback situation. Now I know that a lot of players out there scrub their Instagram clean after a season. A lot of these guys, they spend more time on their Instagram probably than they do practicing. So after a year, it's like, oh, I got to get rid of all 400 pictures that I posted along the way. And so it's not completely abnormal to see somebody do that. But for Kyler Murray to do that and just have two pictures left and then the Cardinals turn around and I don't know that there's anything to that, but they turn around and delete a bunch of pictures off their Instagram, too. And then you have reports that come out. I don't know if there's going to be anything that comes from this, but this is a team that's got some big name free agents that are going to potentially be hitting the market. It's a team that has had a lot of issues with closing out seasons under Cliff Kingsbury. I think that there's a little bit of locker room tension because of that. And I think there's some tension because of Kyler Murray and his body language and the way that he carries himself on the field. I think that that rubs his teammates, a lot of them, the wrong way. So I don't know that the reports that have come out are necessarily accurate, but... I think the Cardinals could have a potentially tumultuous offseason. I don't expect they're going to be trading Kyler Murray, but I'm also not going to sit here and say it's impossible either based on what we've seen. So I think Arizona could have a very rocky offseason if the dominoes fall the wrong way for them. I think the Rams are going to be fine. They'll be able to create cap space. The 49ers are in a pretty good spot. Seattle could be in a good spot, could be a rough offseason for them. But I think the Cardinals, that is a team to watch especially with the way the season finished out. Chaz tweets, would it make sense to franchise tag Rashad Penny rather than a multi-year deal? I've had a lot of chances to talk about Rashad Penny. Ty, what do you think in this front? Uh, simply, no. <laughs> the franchise tag is only $8.5 million, which doesn't seem like a lot, but this is a fairly good running back market in general. So, yeah, I don't think the Seahawks should feel pressed to use the franchise tag, pay him eight and a half million dollars for what is essentially six games worth of production that he's shown you. And I think they can get him for less and for a longer term contract, because I, I think that's ideally what you would like to land at least a two year deal with him in case he does pop in case this is real. This, this sudden rise to prominence is real. I think you would like to get him under contract for, for longer than 2022 and maybe have some outs in there in case it doesn't work out. Um, and I think that they can pull that off. Uh, so really, you know, the only player for me that I would use the franchise tag on that makes sense where it's fairly team friendly is on Quandre Diggs. But in that situation as well, I think you would like to get him, you know, locked down for a longer term deal. So, yeah, in the end, uh, just to put it simply, no, don't franchise tag Rashad Penny. I think you can get him for a lot less. And our last question here coming from Seattle Seacrow tweets, how much would you pay Chandler Jones? He's 31 years old, so he's not exactly a spring chicken, not an old player by any means, but I would expect that he's going to be getting a two or three year deal most likely for, from whoever signs him. The Seahawks are probably looking at minimum $17 million annually. 
probably going to be a little bit more than that because you're talking about one of the premier pass rushers, a guy that can still get after the quarterback. I think the Seahawks will have interest if he hits the market. The Cardinals could franchise tag him. They could agree to a long-term deal beforehand. But we'll see what happens. If he hits the market, I think the Seahawks will take a very strong look and they will be aggressive. They know him well. Russell Wilson knows him well, unfortunately. Wilson would like to see him chasing down other quarterbacks in the NFC West wearing a Seahawks uniform. So I think you're looking, though, at a pretty hefty price tag. But they got to be willing to pay that, though, to get that elite pass rusher you got to sometimes open up the uh, checkbook to be able to afford these guys. And John Schneider needs to do that after a rough season because this, to me, is still the biggest need on the Seahawks roster. All right, we're going to get to tight ends here now, position by position review. The Seahawks brought in Gerald Everett, Ty, during free agency. They had Will Disley returning after his first fully healthy season, played in every game in 2020. Colby Parkinson was coming back. Missed a good chunk of his rookie year due, due to a foot injury, but he was back on the roster, performed well early in training camp. This was a group that the Seahawks were very excited about, in large part because of Shane Waldron coming over from the Rams. We know that the Rams love to run 12 personnel, two tight ends on the field, and they like to get their tight ends involved in the passing game. Tyler Higby and Gerald Everett both put up really good numbers during their time together with the Rams. Waldron was the passing game coordinator for a few of those seasons. So expectations were really high. And yet, even though Gerald Everett finished third on the team in receptions and receiving yards and receiving touchdowns, it felt like a letdown. It didn't seem like this group performed the way that people thought it was going to. And this is the second straight year where tight ends have not lived up to the hype. I think two years ago, everybody was excited about Greg Olson coming in, Jacob Hollister in that group. Yeah, Maybe this is on the quarterback not being able to get the football to tight ends, which we've seen as an issue over the years. But they just didn't get it done the way that I think most of us anticipated they were going to this past season. Yeah, I mean – Everett posted career highs in several categories, and still it just didn't feel like anything we were expecting from him. It felt like this, him coming up to Seattle and coming out of the shadow of, of Tyler Higby and becoming a true number one tight end in an offense that you felt like was going to really utilize the tight ends in the past game that was going to put him in possibly, you know, top 10 tight end conversation. And it really wasn't that. And obviously he had a bout with COVID towards the start of the season, missed a couple of games because of that. And there was the Russell Wilson injury that kind of derailed things for the entire offense. And so it's not completely on him, um, but it just, it feels like he could have been utilized more like they could have taken advantage of his talents more and he had some really good games he also had a really really bad game against the 49ers in seattle uh also had a really bad drop against the cardinals but overall he was really useful he was more dependable than not whenever russell wilson looked his way and you know you you look at his situation right now i i think there should absolutely be interest interest in keeping him uh and keeping him in seattle as well as disley but you also look at this market in general. This is a really deep free agent market for the tight end position. I wrote about this on Seahawk Maven, shameless plug. And uh, yeah, there's a ton of tight ends out there and only so much money to go around. And I think that in turn helps the Seahawks in negotiations with Everett and negotiations with Disley uh, and also helps them, you know, peruse the market as well for maybe another option there. But yeah, overall, just looking back on the year that, that Everett had, you, you just, you wish that you probably got more out of him, you know, more than 400 something yards and, uh, you know, four touchdowns and, and all that, that he put together. But uh, yeah, overall, you know, I, I love the talent there. I, I think there's a ton of upside there with Gerald Everett. I would love to see them uh, try to tap into that once again and, and see if they can make it work a little bit better this time around. Yeah, I think I would be in agreement with you. And I think that the thing that people have to understand, the targets were there in the second half of yeah. the season. Russell Wilson was trying to get the ball to Everett, and he had some really good games. I thought he played really well in Green Bay, even though they didn't score any points that game. He led the team in receptions, receiving yards, picked yeah. up some key first downs. He had some good games even when Russell Wilson was out. He had a 40-plus yard catch against the Steelers with Geno Smith playing quarterback. And the thing that he brought that we 
expected he was going to bring to Seattle's offense, and he lived up to the hype in this regard, the ability to break tackles and create after the catch. He was ninth in the NFL for tight ends with 50 or more targets in yards created after the catch per reception. So this is a guy that's extremely difficult to bring down, and he does move the football after the catch as well as any tight end in the sport. And that's something that this offense was missing at that tight end position. And so I think bringing him back makes a lot of sense. And you made good points. This is a free agent class that has a ton of talent. And also, you look at the draft class. I think this is maybe the best tight end group we've seen in four or five years. So you add those two things together – Teams are not going to be throwing big bucks at tight ends. You might be able to get a really darn good tight end at a discount because, as you said, there's only so much money to go around. You've got these draft picks coming in that are going to be under club control for four years. It's a really good class. So there's a chance you could go out and add to this group and get a really good player at a cheap price. And I think Gerald Everett is a very solid tight end. So if you could get him back at a similar price, maybe even a little cheaper than you paid him last year to come back to Seattle and the market dictates that, he and Russell Wilson were starting to build a rapport late in the season. So I I think that that would be something that would be a good fit for him. It'd be a good fit for Russell Wilson. It'd be a good fit for Shane Waldron with his familiarity with Gerald Everett having another go at it. And maybe you can add another player to the equation. We know Will Disley's a great run blocker. He's valuable in that capacity. Uh, But he also hasn't done much in the passing game the last two years. So I don't know what a deal is going to look like for him coming back, especially with some of the talents going to be out there. The Seahawks might feel like they can get somebody that is a similar run blocker that's going to offer more in the passing game and not have to pay that much more for that player. Or there might be a guy in the draft they can bring in. Yeah. All of the wild card here is Kobe Parkinson because that's the player I was most disappointed in this year. And it's not necessarily his fault, but he had such a great start to training camp tie and then he re-injures his foot and then he basically was non-existent until the last couple of games of the season. That's the yeah. only reason that maybe there's a sliver of hope here is you did see him start to get targeted some late in the year. But prior to that, I mean, they were using him as a run blocker 75% of the time, and that is not Colby Parkinson's game. It's good that he's made improvements in that area, and he can be used as an inline tight end. But this guy is a 6'7 wide receiver. You've got to let him run routes, especially in the red zone. Let this kid be a weapon. And it goes back, we talked about on defense, on offense. Use your personnel and maximize the players that you have. I don't feel like they have done that with Colby Parkinson, and I would love to see with him fully healthy and running routes more frequently what he could do in this passing game, especially with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett drawing so much attention. You're hoping D. Eskridge as well. This is a guy that should be a factor in the passing game, and it just hasn't happened yet due to injuries and just poor usage, in my opinion, of a player that's got a unique skill set. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. I think he should absolutely be a mainstay in their red zone packages. I think you got a six seven tight end who's known for having really good hands. You gotta take advantage. Of him. Yeah, he's a good athlete. Like he checks all the boxes for even if he's just purely a red zone specialist, if he's your third tight end on your roster, I mean that's an incredibly valuable asset right there to have. Yeah. So yeah, I I he absolutely needs to be used more. If he if he can stay healthy. He absolutely needs to be utilized more, particularly down near the end zone. It just, there's no excuse for it. It was maddening watching some of these games this past year, and he's just not out on the field whatsoever. He's playing only a handful of snaps, and most of those are near the middle of the field. You know, they're early on in drives and and everything. It's just, it's a poor usage of the talent that you have. And so I, I, I would like to see them, you know, in 2022, better take advantage of the talent that he brings and, and the skill set that he brings. And, uh, you know, just going back to the to the conversation about bringing back Everett real quick and bringing back Disley, like, I think it's important to have some continuity here in this group because this is a this is a group that's gone undergone significant change over the last couple of years. And that's a that's sometimes an issue. That, that sometimes, you know, creates a lack of chemistry there, especially when you have... Russell Wilson, who who has demanded more, you know, to have more weapons and everything, and but he just hasn't had enough time to really get in the groove with a lot of these guys. So I think if you, you know, you talked about how he was starting to really establish a rapport there with with Gerald Everett, bring him back, you know, continue that relationship there, let that grow, and that might incredibly benefit you moving forward. So yeah, I 
I would not be disappointed if if I'm a Seahawks fan looking ahead at this offseason and the Seahawks just keep things status quo at tight end with Disley and Everett and they bring those two guys back because I think having that continuity can also do wonders, maybe even you know benefit you even more than just bringing in David Njoku and a draft prospect or someone, you know, just as an example there. I think really to, to have those guys come back in, because you have the talent. Everett's an incredibly talent pass, talented pass catcher. He can block a little bit as well. Disley's obviously a strong blocker. And when he had the ball in his hands this past year, he was actually making some things happen after the catch. And we know that he's a, he's a pretty good pass catcher when he is healthy. We've seen him explode for incredible numbers you know, before he got hurt in, in both of his first two years. So there's potential there. And there, there's a lot of potential in this tight end group if say a status quo. So I'm really intrigued by that. I'm really intrigued by how they attack this moving forward because there's so many options. There's so many ways they can go about it. But even keeping things the way that it, that it is, I think, can really help them in 2022. As always, we appreciate you making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Now make sure to check out the Locked On Bets podcast and make it your second listen for the day, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Ty at Dane GNZLZ. I believe I got that correct. Yes. Yep. D-A-N-G-N-Z-L-Z. Make sure to check out Locked on Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, five days a week streaming on YouTube. Coming up on tomorrow's show, I'll be joined by Nick Lee for Free Agency Friday. We'll be checking out a couple of prospects for all four teams on or all four teams in the NFC South, which players may pique the Seahawks' interest heading into free agency. Hope you'll be listening in. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Go Hawks.